Yes, I do in various ways. Uh, obviously geographically, but also in terms of cultural history, historical identity and things of that sort. Well, it involves being part of a historical identity uh, which goes back a very, very long time. Uh, the whole idea of what you might call Christian Western civilization, essentially. Not that I actually think, as a professional historian, that that's still extant, actually. Uh, but certainly we're living in a world which has the inheritance from that civilization. And in terms also simply of family connections, family memories and like, in the sense that I'm descended from people who've lived in this part of the world for a very long time. I think that's an interesting question actually because when I was growing up the kind of thing that was tending to be on the news a great deal was actually news from things like the war in Vietnam and uh, things that were going on in the United States at the time. But I think the formative thing that would have been going on for me in terms of events would have been the events of May 1968 in France uh, and other events that took place on the European continent in that rather dramatic year. So I vividly remember uh, watching the news bulletins from Paris as a 13 year old and also the news that the uh, Warsaw Pact had intervened to suppress the Prague Spring reforms uh, under Dubček in 1968 uh, and just generally the kind of um, political upheaval and unrest that was going across Europe at that time in the late 1960s early 1970s. So that's the kind of formative experience for me of defining what Europe was and what defined it in a way was both the feeling that there was a kind of commonality across borders in terms of the politics that was going on but also of course this huge divide across Europe uh, in the shape of the Iron Curtain and the division between East and West brought about by the Cold War. I suppose it would be the Czech intervention, yes. This awareness that there was this great big barrier on the other side of it was these regimes, the Soviet satellite states, uh, which that event showed had no real freedom of manoeuvre. That's, uh, that's a difficult question because actually things have been going fairly well for quite a, a long, long time. Um, I think some of the worst things have happened recently. I wouldn't say there's a single specific event. It's the general tendency of politics in countries like Poland and Hungary that I would point to as being particularly bad um, things happening right now, if you will. It's the growth of an explicitly anti-liberal politics. Uh, particularly in, and most explicitly in Hungary uh, with Viktor Orban who was quite openly and overtly engaged in trying to create a post-liberal democracy uh, in a way which I think is extremely threatening and also deeply ironic given his own um, original background when Fidesz was set up uh, but also with what's going on with the Kaczynski government and the PIS government in Poland. I think that this is a kind of politics that is extremely dangerous, not necessarily novel uh, but one which, unfortunately, is very much on the rise in many parts of Europe right now. The fall of the Berlin Wall. Given what I said earlier about how a formative part of my idea of European history was the way in which it was divided by the Cold War and the aftermath of World War II, it would definitely be the fall of the Berlin Wall, which was something which uh, I certainly didn't expect, would never have expected or predicted. So if you'd told me in uh, 1980 or 1985 even that within three or four years the Berlin Wall would collapse and that the whole division of Europe that the Second World War brought about would suddenly disappear, uh, I would have uh, wondered what you'd been on basically. Uh, it, it does, that was actually quite a learning experience for me because what it revealed was the degree to which things that appear to be unshakable, permanent and settled actually may well not be. Um, it should not surprise me because that's one of the lessons of history in fact. Uh, but I wasn't expecting such a, a dramatic change to happen at that time. But that was definitely the best thing that's happened in my lifetime. Well actually I think the thing that it most did for me was Schengen and the, the freedom of movement within Europe. Uh, that was definitely a huge benefit for me personally, and also I think for many, many other people, and that's the thing I appreciate most. Uh, what I would have liked the EU to do actually is to sort out the, uh, this is a huge ass, I think what I would like it to do is to sort out its current governmental and structural crisis, uh, because my own view of this is that it took a significant wrong turning 
at the time of the Maastricht Treaty, uh, a crucial part of which was against the advice of pretty much every economist on the planet, creating a single currency without the political infrastructure to support a single currency in an area that's not an optimal currency area. And we're still living with the results of that, I think, and it, it, it's a question of how we sort it out. So what I would like the EU to do by 2030 is to actually revisit the kind of decisions they made at Maastricht and um, n not reverse them um, necessarily, but get them right, move on to a kind of structure that is actually more resilient and more uh, able to deal with reality because what we have at the moment is a system which uh, can be kept going on a kind of day-to-day -day basis but which you can you know sooner or later if it goes on as it is is going to hit a crisis which will destroy it which is not something I would want to see happen so uh, it's a question of how to do it and to put that into a longer term historical perspective I would say that the EU almost from the start was a Christian democratic project and one of the reasons why um, I think they made the wrong decision at Maastricht was that they, they chose the wrong kind of element of that Christian democratic tradition to base their decisions on. Instead of going for the principle of subsidiarity, channeling Althusius if you will, uh, what they did instead was to uh, go for the route of corporatism at the pan-European level and uh, that was bad enough and then having done that they will the, the end without willing the means adequately. And I think that's what we need to revisit. For me, I think it would look like, I think there's a historical model it can follow, which is that it would look something like uh, the Holy Roman Empire as it was after the reforms of Maximilian, uh, when you had things like the Orlic Council, uh, the reform structure of the Diet. So what I would actually like to see is a situation where the national, current national tier of European government has been diminished dramatically uh, and you have a kind of pan-European level to deal with a certain number of mainly geopolitical challenges uh, but in which most of the functions currently handed out by national level states are devolved down to much smaller units which are held together by a common system of rules and uh, governors which is how the Holy Roman Empire worked uh, and I, I think that would be the kind of best model I would like to see. So I don't like either the idea of a Europe de patrie, um, sovereign states cooperating in a limited way, which is the kind of model I think a lot of people in the UK would like to see. But I also don't like the idea of a kind of more Napoleonic Europe in which uh, there's a kind of much more of a single governmental system, and a much more prescriptive kind of authority at the centre. I think that what we this this kind of populist nationalism, national collectivism, as I would rather call it, that we can see rising in many European countries at the moment. I mentioned Poland and Hungary, but that's just the ones where it's been most successful. You could mention Sweden, Germany, Italy, Britain, maybe a whole lot of countries. I think what is driving that is not so much the EU uh, and the EU's policies. It's rather the a couple of things. One of them is the way in which the world economy has developed, and in particular the way in which the world economy is increasingly made up of interconnected city regions rather than national economies. And what that has led to in every country, pretty much everywhere, is a situation where you have globally connected city regions that are highly successful, and then rural areas and often ex-industrial areas that are not successful. Uh, which feel themselves to be left behind, if you will, uh, and disregarded and ignored and also, what really annoys me, condescended to. And that is what's driving a lot of the populist collectivism. The other thing that's happened, I think, apart from the way the world economy has developed, um, is the growth of an ideology which emphasises personal identity and personal choice, which personally I support, but which is provoking a kind of ideological reaction which is to reassert a kind of notion of identity that sees it as rooted uh, specific to a particular place and location and defined by things over which you have no choice such as where you're born, uh, what what kind of place you grow up in, what your ethnicity is, what your religion is maybe even. Uh, clearly there's an element of truth in that which is why it has a powerful appeal uh, but it's very much a reaction against what you might call the growth of a cosmopolitan sense of identity which tends to go along with the kind of city-based 
uh, networked international society that I mentioned a moment ago. And so I think those are the two factors that are driving this. Technology plays a part in as much as the growth of modern communications technologies and the enormous reductions in the cost of communication and transport is what more than anything else has driven the growth of this networked kind of international economy. There's, there's two slightly different things going on here. One is physical movement. In some ways, um, physical movement is... The growth in that can be exaggerated compared to the past. We forget just how much people moved, say, in the 19th century. Before 1914, there were only two countries in Europe that required a passport to enter, which was the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire. And that Everyone at the time thought this showed how backward they were. Uh, and you had 13 million people migrate from Britain just to the United States in the course of the 19th century. So there was really widespread movement of people on an enormous scale uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. So in some ways, the kind of level of migration we have now is not new. It's just what is new is the frequency of journeys and movement across borders. That's what's more novel. Uh, the second thing is, the, well, the other thing we're talking about, though, is communications technology. And I think that's what is more significant, because it's what you allude to. It's the way in which this makes possible connections and links across geopolitical borders, which create communities of interest or identity uh, or of ideology, which go across national borders, and that undermines the privacy of national politics. And obviously, this has produced a pushback. I think the EU, yeah, I, I think transnational organisations generally could be a help, uh, simply because uh, they can create the framework or structures within which people can uh, work together across national borders in order to address challenges, work out what is going on, uh, work out how to avoid the problems posed by new technologies and perhaps adopt them best. Um, I'm not sure that, it, that there's an, a supranational agency such as the EU can actually intervene directly in terms of doing things itself. It's more a matter of creating a framework within which people can work in this way. Because the alternative, in the absence of such an organisation, is that you have to do it on a national basis or on a purely kind of private basis, you know, which can be uh, much more difficult because you might not have the institutional and rule-based environment that would make it possible to do that.